Good morning, Discovery. Good morning, Houston. Great wake-up music. Well, just because you're 179 miles up doesn't mean you can get away from that little guy. He's after you. We had a feeling we'd hear more about that. You will. Discovery. Go ahead, Discovery. So, Mark, just wanted to tell you, you can pass along to Jeff Stone that we're very impressed he got us an IFM within the first 20 hours. Okay, we'll do that, Nancy. And uh, you'll be happy to know that the uh, on Tedris, the two single-axis antenna reflectors are now deployed, so all appendages have been deployed, and the on-orbit checkout is continuing nominally. That's terrific news, Mark. Uh, everything went just so smoothly yesterday. We were all really pleased. Happy. Being panned over in an effort to discover Houston for BDS. in an effort to look at Tropical Storm Chantal. Yes, Don, uh, our suggestion is possibly that you check the jumpers uh, that were part of the IFM for that cable. Uh, we're asking you to do that in view of the number of restarts. We think that there might be a possibility of intermittent contact. And uh, when you're certain that uh, the jumpers are solid, we suggest you restart with step eight on page 1-4 of the payload ops. Okay, I'll get the multimeter out and recheck our connectors and then uh, our jumper cables and then we'll begin with step eight again. Good read back. Again, the instrumentation and communications officer here in the new mission control center is uh, panning the aft port camera of Discovery to take a look at Tropical Storm Chantal in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Cuba as Discovery orbits 200 miles above. Meanwhile, uh, spacecraft communicator Mark Garneau talking with uh, Mission Specialist Don Thomas on board Discovery about the uh, in-flight maintenance procedure designed to get the bioreactor development system working. 
on the crew to check that they have gray taped the uh, appropriate pin connectors properly and a new cable that will be used to make the experiment active. He asked Don Thomas to check and make sure that the rotating wall was rotating, uh, which he did, which indicates there's power to the experiment. And we're with you on the flight deck. Uh, good morning. Welcome aboard Discovery. We're 160 miles above the Earth, just approaching the southern tip of Baja. And we'd like to uh, share a moment with you to dedicate the uh, new Consolidated Control Center. After 30 years of hard work, which included over 100 manned space flights from our old control rooms, we're now entering the next century by opening the new control center, which will lead our manned spaceflight program into uh, future benefits aboard the International Space Station and into the next century, continuing our exploration of the solar system for the benefit of humankind. Aboard Discovery on this flight, we have a plaque that commemorates the opening of the new control center, and it says, in recognition of the first flight flown from this mission control room, this plaque was flown on the flight STS-70 on board the Space Shuttle Discovery. Built by the pirate teamwork and powered by pirate spirit, and we dedicate it to all the folks who have worked in the flight control rooms and who will work in the new control room. And it's our honor to carry this plaque for those folks, and we do dedicate it to their teamwork and effort and it's not the rooms that make the difference, it's the people that man those rooms. And we trust our lives and our nation's manned space program to those folks, and we are proud to be a part of your team. As one of the members of the crew, as well as Don Thomas, that did work as a CAPCOM for at least a year in the Mission Control Center, I'd just like to pass on my word of thanks to those folks. Uh, it's one of the most professional organizations I've ever seen. It's so well run. People give their heart and soul on it every day of every mission uh, to support each and every one of us, and we can't thank you enough. Again, congratulations to the Mission Operations Directorate and John Morator and his folks that uh, put so many long hours into preparing the room to be prepared for STS-70. Uh, congratulations, and we're looking forward to this flight and many more in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, in the Orbit 1 uh, shift, we're certainly proud to be working in the uh, new facility. We also think it's great. Uh, you'll be glad to know that uh, since you're the first mission to fly out of this new uh, flight control room, we have a very nice plaque of your mission patch as well as your crew photo hanging in our room. Well, that's quite an honor for us, and we're going to try and downlink you a closer picture of the uh, plaque and we hope that uh, many more patches adorn a new control center and uh, the historical missions that were flown from the old, I'm sure, will be followed by future historic missions from this new control center. And uh, again, we'll try and show you a good picture of the plaque. Thanks, Tom. And uh, Kevin, that looks good. We have a, a great close-up of the patch.
STS-70 Commander Tom Hendricks, and we're now uh, flanked on the outside. left. Thanks. STS-70 Commander Don Tom Hendricks, uh, flanked on the left by Mission Specialist Nancy Curry, and on the right by Pilot Kevin Kriegel, presenting a commemoration of the first flight of the new Mission Control Center here in Houston. Once again, receiving down, downlink television from the payload bay cameras of the shuttle Discovery as it passes about 200 miles above the Gulf of Mexico. Cameras now zooming in on the Florida Peninsula and the Cape Canaveral area. On the previous orbit, the crew downlinked a good view of Tropical Storm Chantal, which is uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, just outside the Gulf, off the coast of Cuba. There's a good chance we'll get another view of that on this orbital pass, which is uh, very close to the same track as the last pass. We're now looking at uh, oil droplets that are part of the embryo being looked at in the space tissue loss experiment. On this image, the oil droplets can be seen in the upper right portion of your screen while the uh, embryo is uh, farther down and toward the center of the screen. These embryos are very young and in the glassula stage.
And again, this information is uh, very important to understanding the effects of long duration space flight uh, on living systems. This, vid this video can be uh, viewed and recorded real time uh, at the Kennedy Space Center where scientists in the Life Sciences Support Center are comparing these embryos with uh, a control group on the ground. If you'd like me to uh, do something different with the picture or stay on it for a little longer, just let me know. Okay, Nancy, uh, we'll we'll talk about that. Discover Houston, that's an excellent uh, view. It gives us a real perspective on uh, what this storm looks like on a planetary scale. Yeah, Nancy's proud of that one. Get that 40 millimeter Hasselblad on it. Kevin's cranking away. Tell me if you can imagine the uh Biggest problem I was having controlling the cameras was that I'm on the floor with five people on top of me looking out the window. Woody's up there too. Okay, don't get any boot prints on your back there. Discovery, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Discovery's ready. New York Times, this is Houston. Please call Discovery for a voice check. Discovery, this is New York Times. How do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Welcome aboard Discovery. We're 160 miles above the Earth, and we're just now crossing the Philippines. It's dark outside. And this afternoon, you've got uh, Mary Ellen Weber just now coming into view, and Kevin Kriegel, and myself, Tom Hendricks, and we're ready to take your questions. That sounds terrific. The, the, uh, we're thrilled to have you with us. The, the only things we'll ask is uh, that you speak at a moderate pace because we're, we're typing and transcribing your answers as we go. And uh, the questions are, are mostly for both of you, so if you could identify yourselves before you answer, that would be terrific. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna point we understand. with our with our first question. The first question comes from uh, Bien Du in Arkansas, and uh, she wants to be an astronaut. And a lot and she and a lot of other people in our audience want to hear about the biological experiments you're conducting up there and the communication satellite that you've released into space. Well, we'll start with the satellite first. Uh, it was released yesterday. And it was the last of a series of satellites to join a system that transmits data from satellites 
or uh, telescopes or any other transmitting device like the shuttle or the future International Space Station to Earth, and it acts as a relay system. So it takes the transmissions from things in space and uh, passes them on to the Earth, and it can do that at an extremely high rate and can uh, maintain that system for many years. And this satellite is, again, the last to join that system. And I'll let uh, Mary Ellen Weber answer the uh, question about our biological experiments. Please uh, move much slower and identify ourselves at the point when we start talking. Uh, Houston, did you, uh, Discovery, did you hear that, please? Dis yes, we copied that, and we will. This is Mary Ellen Weber, and I'm one of the mission specialists aboard the flight, and I'd like to tell you about some of the biological experiments that we're doing. The first experiment is the bioreactor, and this is a system, it's a rotating vessel, and it has nutrients for human cells, in this case human colon cancer cells, to grow. And because it rotates, it mimics what goes on in the human body extremely well. And because of that, we can figure out how cancer cells actually travel from, say, the colon to the liver or the kidneys. And that's the objective of that experiment. Another experiment that we're doing is Protein, protein crystal growth, and uh, uh, maybe I can tell you more about that some other time. Uh, next question. Okay. Slower. Okay. Uh, and if we could just go a little bit slower, please. Uh, George in Connecticut wonders that what you can. Uh, wonders what the difference between the shuttle's commander and pilot is, and and could the commander and the pilot be the same person? Well, the biggest difference. Uh, and this is Kevin Kriegel, the pilot, and uh, the biggest difference is that the commander is much, much older. <laughs> so, but seriously, uh, both the commander and the pilot uh, trained to do most of the same duties. The pilot backs up the commander. The commander usually has two flights under his belt and is a lot more experienced. This is Tom's third flight and my first flight. It's a lot like on an airliner when you have a captain and a co-pilot. You have the captain who's highly experienced running the ship and the uh, pilot who's learning and back.